this one. Everyone see my slideshow okay still? Yep. Fantastic. Okay. Okay, well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Adam Carlin. I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement at the Everson Museum of Art in Syracuse, New York. Um, before we dive into this evening's program, I'm going to take a quick moment to tell you all about some exciting things that are happening here at the Everson. Um, we recently opened our exhibition, Curious Vessels, the Rosenfield Collection in our Paul and Sharon Phillips Ceramic Center. Uh, this exhibition features dozens of functional ceramic pieces from Louise Rosenfield's collection who had one important prerogative for the donation of these artworks that they be used. So our, our upcoming restaurant, Louise, will be stocked with these ceramics pieces that patrons can eat out of and drink out of. It's a super fun and interactive exhibition and definitely a must see. Another really quick mention is Charlie Friedman's exhibition, Soundtrack for the Present Future an immersive auditory installation of over 70 secondhand guitars, mandolins, uh, and basses to come together to create this incredible singular instrument. Tomorrow, there'll be a live music recital featuring original compositions uh, played on this incredible installation by David Fulmer and the New Leaf Ensemble. This installation sadly goes down April 10th, so head on over and do it soon. We also boast an array of upcoming adult workshops, youth classes, concerts, film screenings, and more. You can learn more about um, on our website at everson.org. So the program tonight is part of the exhibition Woe by artist Dawn Williams Boyd and made possible by our generous sponsors, the Colby Foundation and the Lenore G. Tawney Foundation. Woe, curated by Daniel Fuller for the Dodd Galleries at the University of Georgia, will be up at the Everson also until April 10th. So there's still time to head down there to see this incredible and powerful exhibition. Woe is a collection of cloth paintings that reflect for, for Dawn a lifelong critique of social injustices and racial violence, epic battles with misogyny and physical and psychological abuses of power. Dawn collages uh, together with fabric, monumental moments of American history that are so often lost or ignored. So when speaking with Dawn about creating some learning and engagement programs as part of this exhibition, it really became clear that the engagement initiative should have the same intention as the artworks themselves. They should be there to preserve and teach history. So to do so, Dan, Dawn provided us with her uh, reading list of books that either inspired works in the exhibition Woe or other pieces throughout her career. So these books from this list are on display at Syracuse University Libraries and branches of the Onondaga County Library, both of, both of which are sponsors also of tonight's program. Um, so students and community members are encouraged to take these books out for loan and learn about the history themselves. 
And we are just so lucky to have uh, an author of one of those books, Ben Green, who wrote Before His Time, The Untold Story of Harry T. Moore, America's First Civil Rights Martyr, here with us. Um, as you will see, uh, this book to help inform the piece in the exhibition, uh, Peaches and Evangeline, that Dawn will be speaking about in just a moment. I am also just so overjoyed that we also have joining us um, Harry T. Moore's grandson and Evangeline Moore's, again, we'll learn about, about in a moment, uh, son, Strafer Skip Pagan. Uh, Skip is dedicated to continuing his mother's work of educating people about the legacy of his grandparents. So I trust that this will be a really exciting conversation. Um, after hearing from Dawn, Ben, and Skip, we'll have lots of time for questions. So throughout, please feel free to write those in the Q&A option. Um, and I'll field them when the time comes. And I'll also put the website link in the chat where you can learn more about our distinguished guests. And it is my honor to introduce Dawn Williams Boyd. Adam, thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Um, I wanna thank the wonderful folks at the Everson and especially um, Adam Carlin for inviting us all here today and for our sponsors for making this possible. Um, Peaches and Evangeline is a, a one of several pieces of artwork I've done over the years that are part of a series called Sins of the Fathers that discusses racial atrocities that have happened throughout the United States history um, over the last 400 years or whatever it is. Um, the interesting thing about this particular piece is that unlike most of the pieces in that series, this one is, uh, it doesn't show anybody being lynched. It doesn't show anybody being abused. It shows two beautiful young African-American women apparently at their ease. And I did that specifically so that the image would draw you in so that you would have the same kind of discovery that I had when I first encountered Mr. Green's book. The piece of the title that enticed me was The Untold Story. And I had been steeping myself in stories about racial injustice um, for that particular Sins of the Father series. And frankly, I had never heard of Harry T. Moore. And when asking my contemporaries the question, they had never heard of him either. So the fact that Mr. Green had put the untold story, and then he, I think he also put uh, a martyr to the civil rights um, effort that intrigued me. So um, I frankly found the book at a used bookstore um, some many years ago, and I was intrigued by it because it was just this plain little black book. I think it had lost its cover. And so um, I picked it up and read the first couple of pages inside, and I was interested to know more. So I skimmed through it, paid for it, took it home with me, read it cover to cover. And I was amazed that you know, before Medgar, before Martin Luther King, before Malcolm X, before all the people that we are familiar with who were instrumental in the struggle for the civil rights of African-Americans in this country, um, there was this man who was out in the woods in Florida or in the swamps in Florida for all intents and purposes, you know, working, doing this work by himself. And um, he was uh, interested in making sure that uh, our people took advantage of a situation that we had finally been, uh, uh, been given and that is the right to vote. And isn't it interesting that here we are again, what, 50 odd years later, having the same issue come up. So I think it's very appropriate that we're talking about this particular civil rights hero at this particular time. 
what um, we're going to hear a lot more from uh, Mr. Pagan and Mr. Green about the history. I want to talk to you about the artwork. Um, this piece was done in 2004, and so that was about three years after I began or after I had switched from painting in uh, acrylics on cardboard and plywood, and I began to work in fabric in earnest. For those of you who have, are not familiar with my work and have not seen this particular piece, it is in fact made totally of fabric. There's no paint on it at all. It's to made totally of fiber. Um, I like to refer to my work as cloth paintings because as an artist, I work from, I began my career as a painter, as I said, in oils and acrylics, and I still feel like I'm painting. I just changed my medium from oil and acrylics to fabric and thread and embroidery floss, et cetera. So this piece is, um, was done in 2004. It's 72 inches tall and 53 and a half inches wide. When I first started making um, cloth paintings, I was working from the tradition of uh, quilting versus painting. So there are several pieces of this uh, cloth painting that are a little bit different from the work that I'm doing now. Uh, for example, it has a border, which um, my current work no longer has, and it has a uh, black line that sort of encloses the piece. Um, it also has sort of an atmospheric quality to it. Um, when I first started quilting, I was using the, or using quilting methods. So I did a lot of piecing, which means putting little tiny pieces of cloth together and sewing them into a pattern. And if you look at the background behind Peaches and Evangeline's head, you'll be able to see the squares of fabric that I have sewn together to make uh, on the upper left-hand side, some greenery that would have appeared behind their vehicle. And on the, in the center and on the right-hand side, um, sort of an atmospheric um, uh, way to show the blue sky and the clouds that were in the background. One of the other things that, uh, and for information's sake, um, that I, I admire quilters who have the patience to do that in their work. I am unfortunately not one of them. So uh, this is one of the very last pieces in my collection that has that particular attention to detail. Um, now I, I'm at the stage in, in the way that I do this work where I am trying to get as, as much done as quickly as possible. You'll also notice if you look really closely and especially on the, the darker figure on the left-hand side, if you look very closely around her eyes, you'll notice that there is a slight difference in the value uh, in the light and dark uh, around her eyes. Um, I was using different patterned fabrics to make the shadows. And I've stopped doing that also simply because I've gotten older and my fingers don't allow me to make little tiny fold overs that way anymore. Um, what can you do about getting older? So um, I want you to also notice though you can barely see it, but the top lip of each of these figures is done in red fabric. And I will confess to you that that was not the way it was done originally. Originally, I had just done a dark lip to simply indicate that it was the top lip versus the bottom. And then I had, uh, many, many years ago, I had a gentleman walk up to me and ask me, why are those two guys wearing dresses? he was interpreting the black lip as mustaches and 
even though everything else in the piece indicated that they were women or girls, what he saw was two guys with mustaches wearing dresses. So even though young uh, teenage girls in the 40s would not have worn red lipstick, I had to go back into the piece, which is something I really dislike doing. But I went back into it and made a slight adjustment so that we don't have to have that conversation anymore. I thought that was hysterical. So my the the what you'll find many times in the work that I make is that there's two things happening from my perspective. One is that I'm trying to tell you a story. In this particular instance, what I have done is to take a photograph that Harry took of him, himself, of his daughters uh, in the early 40s on a time when they were out and about, riding around in the car, doing what people do when it's a beautiful, warm, sunny day. They may have been out visiting or whatever it was to do at that time. But he, he stopped and he, took, he made a point of recording the history of his family by taking a picture of his children up against what I'm going to assume is his car. So the, as I said earlier, the, this piece is very different from most of the pieces in the Sins of the Father series in that it does not show something bad happening it shows something really wonderful happening. And as I said earlier, I wanted you, I wanted this piece to draw your attention so that when you got up close to it and read the little sticker that's on the side of it at where it talks about what happened to their parents, this image would stick in your head versus the image of the way their parents died. That was really important to me. I hoped that you would find the book, read the book, learn some history, and uh, understand that even here in 2022, we are still dealing with some of the issues that uh, were happening in 1942, and that it's time for us to push on and pass that. The other thing that I always try to do in my artwork for my own uh, interest is to figure out a way to do something that I have not done in previous pieces. So I had done the patching before, as I said, this is but the last time that you will find this in my work. What I had not done though, if you'll notice on the figure on the right hand, the right hand side, the little um, shirt that she's wearing, the little blouse she's wearing is made of strips of lace. Um, those of you who are old enough to remember women's fashions from the 40s, I'm not quite that old, but I've seen pictures. Um, oftentimes you would see um, a blouse that was sheer because we're talking about Florida and we're talking about the summertime. So it's extremely hot, it's extremely sticky, and so you would wear as little as possible um, to maintain your modesty. But for young women in particular, what you would often find is a very sheer shirt or blouse that you would wear over your bra and over your slip, but it would be sheer to the point where you would be able to see little peaks of the undergarments. So I used uh, strips of lace, one layered on top of the other, to make that um, type of shirt. And I thought it, I think it came out pretty well. Um, the other thing that I wanted to do with this piece, I had, I'm, I'm a crazy person when it comes to fabric. Um, when I was painting in acrylics, I spent a lot of time in paint stores. And now I spent a lot of time in fabric stores. And I found the, the flowered pattern that the figure on the left is wearing and held on to it for a very long time, trying to figure out how I was going to use it. And I remembered or I was inspired to see that 
uh, again, women in that time frame, especially in the summertime, wore very lightweight, very light colored, and oftentimes very flowered um, garments. And so I decided to go ahead and use this piece of fabric. You'll notice that there are ribbons at the um, elbow on the left and at the neck of the figure on the left. And you will also notice that the fabric of their clothing is the same fabric that we used around, that I used around the edge of the piece. So that is Peaches and Evangeline from the perspective of the artist. And I hope that you will take the time to read the book that we'll be talking about later. And uh, Adam, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. So I'm gonna go uh, hand it over to Ben Green. Uh, and please just give us a moment as we switch screens. For those of you who are just joining us, we are gonna have a Q&A at the end of this. So please uh, don't hesitate to ask questions in the Q&A option below. Adam, are we good on the, uh, we have the right slide showing? Yep, looks great. Okay, great. All right, uh, I just wanna say I'm very honored uh, to be here this evening and to share this presentation with Dawn, who uh, I just got to meet uh, just for a few minutes before we started. And I was fascinated by what she just described, uh, not only the intention of the piece, but also the way she actually did it. And also with Skip, uh, Pagan, the grandson of Harry T. Moore. So um, what I'm going to do, actually, uh, uh, I have one slide I just want to show you. I, this is the, I've written four books. Um, here's a slide about the other, uh, two of the others. The left, one on the left is about a little fishing village my family's from. And then my most recent book uh, is the history of the Harlem Globetrotters. But clearly the one that's most significant of the four is the one about Harry T. Moore. Um, and so what I'm going to do uh, right now is tell you a little bit about uh, Harry Moore as a person and then about the incredible work he did as a civil rights leader on three major fronts, education, lynching, and the right to vote. And then Skip is going to share his reflections about his mother, Evangeline, and his grandfather, which will bring all this home in a very uh, personal way. Personal way. Uh, but I'm going to start um, with a famous uh, quotation uh, from William Faulkner, which fits a lot um, with what Dawn was saying earlier. Faulkner wrote, the past is never dead. It's not even past. And this is going to be really our, our text for this evening, our chapter and verse, so to speak. And I'll keep coming back to this. And I hope by the end, you'll come to agree with me that this story is not ancient history. Um, even though some of these events happened decades ago, the underlying issues are still with us today uh, in some of our own lives and certainly in the lives and the memories of our parents, our grandparents, and perhaps even our children. So Harry Tyson Moore was born in 1905 in a tiny community. It's not even incorporated. Uh, it's called Houston just south of this town of Live Oak in Swanee County, Florida, just a few miles from the river that Stephen Foster immortalized in song. So what was the world like in 1905 for young Harry Moore? Well, uh, frankly, Swanee County still looked and felt very much like the Old South. Cotton was still king. Um, in the next few years, the boll weevil would ravage the cotton industry to the point that tobacco, turpentine, and naval stores became more of the dominant um, agricultural products. But no one in 1905 would have mistaken Florida for a vacation paradise. Annual per capita income was barely half the national average, $112 a year. Children attended school only 50 days a year 
on average. And in fact, I have a picture of young Harry Moore in school. See him with the arrow. This is the earliest photo that we have of him. In 1905 in Suwannee County, um, it felt like the Old South because it was the Old South. And uh, in Suwannee County and all over Florida, racism was overt and pervasive. Social scientists talk about institutionalized racism, meaning it's not just that some white people don't like black people, but that racial prejudice is embedded in the schools, churches, businesses, and government. And it's also one way it is institutionalized is in popular culture. And these postcards, which were known as coon cards, were very popular in Florida. They're just series after series of these that were sold all through into the 1930s uh, and 40s. Um, in 1905, it was only nine years after Plessy versus Ferguson made separate but equal the law of the land. And the Florida legislature, shown here on the Capitol steps in my hometown of Tallahassee, uh, had made it illegal for white and black children to be taught in the same school, for white teachers to teach black children, and even textbooks for white and black children had to be stored separately. Um, beyond that, uh, emboldened by Plessy, the legislature instituted more Jim Crow laws so that were, there was separate seating on railroads, streetcars, there were separate waiting rooms and ticket windows, separate jail cells, separate reform schools, and interracial cohabitation and marriage were outlawed. Department stores refused to allow blacks to try on clothes, and they had to wear tissue paper over their hair to try on hats. In the plush uh, resort town of Palm Beach, wealthy, mostly Yankee tourists <laughs> rode in Afro mobiles, rickshaws peddled by uniformed black men, which were still in use, believe it or not, after World War II. In Harry Moore's hometown of Live Oak, there were no paved streets. There were only six houses with indoor plumbing. And Live Oak was known primarily uh, as the home of Florida's most infamous convict labor camp. Uh, the warden of that camp wrote a memoir, which he entitled The American Siberia, which will give you some idea when the warden calls it that, what the place must be like. And he wrote that a Negro could be sent to prison on almost any pretext. Basically, there were such pervasive laws that if somebody wanted to lock a black man up, they could do it. And if they didn't send him to prison, they liked to send him to convict lease camps because they could work them for free to build roads and railroads and so on. Um, th thousands of African-Americans in Florida and millions of African-Americans around the South left around this time in the Great Migration, but Harry Moore's family stayed put. Um, his father, Johnny, worked on the railroad and his job was to tend these big giant water tanks that refueled old fashioned steam engines. His mother, Rosa, worked in the cotton fields and ran a little store, a jitney it was called, selling candy bars, Coke, cigarettes, and hand-churned ice cream. But at age nine, a tragedy struck. Harry's father, Johnny, died. Uh, Harry was a frail, sickly young boy, and his mother, Rosa, knew that his future was not in the fields, so she sent him to live with her three sisters in Jacksonville. This would prove to be the turning point in his childhood. His aunts were educated professionals, a nurse, two teachers, one with a PhD, and Harry became the son they never had. This country bumpkin from the sticks of Suwannee County was suddenly immersed in a vibrant African-American community in Jacksonville. There were many black owned businesses. Um, he was exposed to the Harlem Renaissance, which was exploding in New York. And more than anything, he fell in love with learning and with education. In 1919, he returned back home to Suwannee County and enrolled in the high school program of Florida Memorial College, which still exists today only in Miami. Uh, here's another example of institutionalized racism. As late as 1931, more than half of Florida's 67 counties did not even have a public black high school, which is why every historically black college 
also ran a, a high school program. The past is never dead. It's not even past. If black families wanted their children to receive a high school education, they had to send them away out of town or even out of state to Hampton or Morehouse. The year Harry enrolled at Florida Memorial, the state of Florida spent $11 per capita for white students and $2.64 for black students. Uh, Harry excelled at Florida Memorial College, which offered a classical education. He studied Latin, Greek, and French, along with required Bible courses. His transcript shows all A's for four years, except for one B plus in French. He was so smart, the other students nicknamed him Doc. Uh, he was an award-winning debater and even played on the baseball team. That's him in the back center, uh, even though he was never a great um, physical athlete. In May 1925, he graduated at age 19 with a normal degree, which is the equivalent of a teaching certificate. <clears throat> uh, that fall, he accepted a teaching job. Excuse me, just a sec. <clears throat> accepted a teaching job in the wilderness of Brevard County, formerly known as Mosquito County. And that should tell you all you need to know <laughs> about Brevard County. Uh, the worst mosquitoes I've ever seen in my life were down there. Back in this day, they were known to drop full-grown cows in their tracks. They just swarm on them and kill them. The only thing worse than the mosquitoes in Brevard County were the noceums who would make you lose your mind uh, when they came out in the evenings. Um, he took a teaching job, uh, teaching fourth grade in Coco's Colored Elementary School. And that first year, he met an attractive <clears throat> young woman named Harriet Sims at a bid whist party, a card party. Uh, within a year, they were married. Uh, they built a house on property adjacent to Harriet's parents <clears throat> in an orange grove on the outskirts of Mims, a tiny hamlet directly west of Cape Canaveral. That's the way to place this. Think of where the rockets are at Cape Canaveral. You can basically see the launches from Mims, Florida. The Cape is straight across the, uh, the inland waterway. Two daughters quickly followed. Peaches and Evangeline. In 1927, <clears throat> Harry was promoted to principal of the Titusville Colored School and eventually became the principal of the Mims Colored School, where Harriet taught as well. Life was good in many ways. They had these two beautiful daughters, they had this property, they had their own orange grove. But by 1935, 34, I'm sorry. This reserved, bookish, soft-spoken school principal, not yet 30 years old, would be transformed into an activist. That transformation would change his life, his family, and ultimately the state of Florida. That year in 1934, <clears throat> he organized the Brevard County chapter of the NAACP. In another few years, he became the first executive secretary of the Florida State Conference of the NAACP. And for that point on, every weekend, they would finish school on Friday and they would load up and first their Model T and then their Model A, and they would travel the state of Florida. For 17 years, he traveled the back roads, going from small town to small town to big city, organizing NAACP chapters. Um, he began his activism with what he knew best, education. The disparities between black and white schools and teacher pay were enormous. White teachers were paid twice as much as black teachers. In fact, the least qualified white teacher made more than the most qualified black teacher, including principals. Black schools were treated shoddily in general. Uh, in 1937, the Brevard County School Board spent $69 per capita for white students and $27 for Blacks. Black schools often closed after five months, just in time for the citrus harvest, not coincidentally, with a terse announcement by the school board that they were, quote, out of money. In the Black community in Mims and Titusville, <clears throat> that was interpreted as out of colored money. 
Harry Moore decided <clears throat> to do something about it. On August 5th, 1937, a letter arrived on the desk of the Assistant Special Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in New York, a young attorney only three years out of Howard Law School named Thurgood Marshall. Backed by the Florida State Teachers Association, the Black Teachers Organization, Harry Moore filed the first lawsuit in the Deep South to equalize black and white teacher salaries. Thurgood Marshall easily, eagerly embraced the lawsuit. He even came to Florida on the train to meet Harry Moore. He stayed at their house, which thrilled Evangeline and Peaches no end to have this handsome superstar staying at their house. Harry's best friend and teaching colleague, John Kil Gilbert, agreed to be the plaintiff. This case will be of immense importance, Marshall wrote. In New York, the NAACP predicted the case would have a profound effect on the fortunes of Negro teachers across the South. It certainly had a profound effect on John Gilbert, who was immediately fired, blacklisted, and never taught again. In June 1938, Gilbert B. Board of Public Instruction was dismissed by a circuit court judge. It was later appealed unsuccessfully to the Florida Supreme Court, shown here. And when they made oral arguments, several of these justices <clears throat> literally turned their chairs around and put their faced the wall rather than facing the black attorney representing Harry Moore and the lawsuit. Um, John Gilbert, uh, the, um, John Gilbert was the first to lose his job, but there were many others, including Harriet and Harriet Moore. It would take another decade before the teacher salary battle in Florida was won. Lawsuits were after this one, they were fired, filed in federal court rather than state court, and they won all of those. So Harry Moore lost the first skir skirmish, but he ultimately won the war. The second battlefront that he waged war on was lynching. And filing lawsuits over teacher salaries could get you fired, but protesting lynching could get you killed. First, a few surprising facts. Despite its image as a vacation paradise, Florida was a haven for lynching. From 1900 to 1930, <clears throat> Florida had the highest per capita rate of lynching in the entire South. There were more total lynchings in Alabama and Mississippi but you had a better chance of being lynched in Florida. From 1921 to 1946, Florida had 61 lynchings, twice as many as Alabama, topped only by Mississippi and Georgia. And those atrocities should be as much a part of Florida's history as bathing beauties, alligators, flamingos, or the moss-draped Suwannee River, which ironically was a favorite lynching spot. As this historian wrote, um, James R. McGovern, um, it is unlike, it is doubtful if any black male growing up in the rural South was not traumatized by a fear of being lynched. Harry Moore certainly experienced that himself. When he was at Florida Memorial, there was a lynching in Lake City, 10 miles away, 50 miles away in Perry, several thousand black men in 1922 actually burned Charlie Wright at the stake. Um, and by the way, my father was from Perry. He witnessed that. He was 10 years old. Here's what institutionalized racism looks like. They turned out the schools and told all the school kids, go down to the train depot and watch this. The past is never dead. It's not even past. Um, what were the chances that any white Southerner growing up in that environment with that kind of dehumanized view of black people would not up, end up being racist. Beginning in 1941, Harry Moore challenged every single lynching that occurred in Florida. As the executive secretary of the state NAACP, he churned out dozens of letters on an old hand crank mimeograph machine he mailed them to Florida's governors, congressmen, NAACP branches, professors, newspaper reporters, influential religious leaders around the country. He realized soon that it wasn't enough to write letters, so he started doing his own investigations. <clears throat> he would track down the family of the lynching victim who normally would have led, left town 
take sworn affidavits from them and forward those to Thurgood in New York. The third and final battlefront that he fought on was voting rights. And this is what I think cost him his life. And this is one of his great quotes about it. Um, in 1944, Harry Moore and other NAACP leaders organized the Progressive Voters League. At that time, the only election that mattered in Florida was the Democratic Party primary. There were no Republican office holders in Florida or any other Southern state. Whoever won the Democratic primary won the general election, period. Against fierce opposition, Moore launched a statewide drive to register African-Americans in the Democratic Party. Most supervisors of elections, including his own, just refused to do it, but he persevered. And by May 1945, over 30,000 Black Floridians made history. For the first time, they voted in the Democratic Party primary. By 1948, Black voter registration was up to 69,000. Two years later, he succeeded in registering over 116,000 new voters. That represented 31% of all eligible Blacks in Florida, and the voter registration rate was 50% higher than any other Southern state. On the last night of his life, his final conversation was predicting that the Black vote would determine the outcome of the 1952 governor's race. And that's why he was killed, in my view. It was the greatest tragedy that any could befall any family, although I can't say it was unexpected as Harry had been receiving death threats for years. Nonetheless, it seems unimaginable. On Christmas Day, 1951, he and his wife Harriet were blown up in their house. The Klan attached a bomb, probably dynamite, to the floor joist under their bedroom. When it went off at 10.20 p.m., the explosion could be heard four miles away in Titusville. People rushed out of their houses in fear, thinking a tanker truck had blown up. Some even thought another missile had exploded at the Cape. Harry and Harriet were literally blown to the ceiling. Their home was destroyed. He died on the way to the hospital. She died nine days later. They're the only husband and wife ever killed in the civil rights struggle. There are three great tragedies in this story. First, that they were murdered. Second, that the murders have never been solved despite multiple investigations. And third, and perhaps most tragic at this point, that they've been forgotten. Their sacrifice is unknown. Their story is left out of the history books. I believe if Harry Moore had been killed three years later in 1954, after the Brown decision, he would be Medgar Evers. He would be in every history book, everyone would know his name. He was Medgar Evers, only he had the audacity to do this work before the country was paying attention, before there was a movement, before the TV cameras were filming the dogs attacking children in Birmingham. It's probably too late to solve the murders, but it's not too late to remember them, to tell their story, to add their sacrifice to the history books and to public awareness. And thankfully, there are a few hopeful signs on that count. In MIMS, there is now a beautiful museum and learning center on the Moore home site, and it includes an exact replica of their house. There's an exhibit about the Moors in the National Museum of African American History in Washington, DC. And they are included in the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, uh, a memorial to lynching victims founded by Brian Stevenson, uh, who you may know from the film Just Mercy. To me, the most hopeful of all, the Brevard County School Board is now developing a curriculum as we speak to teach the Moore story to all middle schoolers in the district, which hopefully will institutionalize their story, a reversal of the past. So again, I'm honored to be here. The one sad note is that Evangeline Moore is not here to witness tonight and these hopeful signs. She passed away in 2015. She was a beautiful, lovely, wonderful woman. But we have the next best thing, her son, Skip Hagen, who's going to share his personal reflections at this time. Thank you, Darren. 
Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for inviting me. It's uh, such an honor to be able to speak and uh, share my reflections on um, the two most influential ladies in my life in, in raising me. Um, so the beautiful work of art that Don created was of uh, Annie Moore and Annie Ann Moore and uh, Juanita Evangeline Moore, um, better known as Peaches and and my mother always went by Van. Uh, I guess later in life, she was uh, most referenced as Evangeline, but I always knew her and the people that are around us and uh, our relatives always referred to her as, as Van. I'd like to kind of take a, a stab at kind of describing the two ladies that I knew. Uh, interestingly enough, they were both different. In, in many ways. But as I would grow, I would understand not only the influence on me as an individual, but also how their personalities kind of in, in, um, influenced or, or shaped my personality. So if you look at my mom, <clears throat> she was best described as more of a homebody, a very reserved, um, but in that being reserved, she had that side of her, which was a side that you really didn't want to cross. Uh, I, uh, as a young boy, learned uh, if I was going to cross that side, it should be only done late in the day. Because when I made mistakes early in the day, she would give me that maybe a pop, but she would also tell me, I'm going to give you a good spanking tonight. And so a young skip would think, okay, she'll forget. And so we would go on with our love fest all day long. And then I would go when it was time to take my bath. And when I emerged, there was that other person. She never forgot. And she always whipped me good. So I had to learn early on, if you're gonna make a mistake, make it late. Clearly, my mother was a daddy's girl, and that was the big tragedy for her. I mean, it was insurmountable, the loss that she, she felt. She used to tell me that um, she would follow her father around the house. She would dread the time that he had to leave the house, and oftentimes, she would find some kind of a s excuse to accompany him anytime she could. Uh, she was a devoted mom. Can't without tears, explain how much she was devoted to raising me. Um, she, as you saw in the picture, was a very fashionable lady. Um, she, she had that aura that when she stepped out of the house, everything was in order. Um, kind of the glamour girl almost situation. And um, she broke the family tradition in that instead of uh, being an educator, she decided that she would leave Florida and come to DC and be a federal employee. So she uh, arrived, she uh, found her first job with the uh, think Department of Labor, but for most of her career, she was um, with the US State Department. If you think about my aunt Peaches, she was a lot different in many ways. She was the lady that liked to go out and have fun and, and club. Um, she was very, very close. As my mother was close to her father, she was close to her mother. Um, my aunt never had children, but she was the greatest aunt one could have and very devoted wife uh, to her husband. And she did follow the tradition of the family in that she would uh, go on to, I think it was called Florida Central, it was in Ocala. She worked there, uh, it was a junior college, uh, as long as I knew until she passed, I think she passed my sophomore year in college. So those, that was the mix of the two ladies. Um, 
if you look at the personality set that that um, that I have, it's a combination of a lot of those per, their personalities as well as I guess some things that were passed down through them by my grandfather, who I never had the honor and privilege to meet. He was um, he left us in '51. I was born in '53, about a year and a half, not quite a year and a half later. But I often heard people that knew my grandfather talk about how soft-spoken he was. And, you know, that is kind of an interesting phenomenon because, and you know, in my life, uh, I've never been one to really raise my voice very much. Even in times of uh, conflict, if you may, I've always taken a very soft-spoken approach. The other side of me though, is just like my mother. Once you push me to that other side, you got a handful. And so I, I can see how her, in her interaction, that kind of influenced me. Um, my, my aunt kind of shared other things where I always, you know, as I was going, I always liked to go out and party and go to clubs. And, um, and so I get a lot of my aunt in me also. And um, I think the tradition starting with my grandparents is that we were all big, big lovers of jazz music. And to this day, um, you know, that's one of my passions in life. You know, my wife is often amazed that we can uh, be driving along and listen to XM radio. And I can hear three to five bars of a uh, jazz musician and tell her, you know, that's Sonny Stitt or that's John Coltrane, or, you know, that's uh, Lee Morgan. And, um, and that comes, I'm sure, as a direct pass down from the love uh, that my grandfather had passed down through his daughters uh, to me. Um, the thing that um, I look at in my mother's evolution as she came to Washington, um, she, she was amazing in the fact that she had to learn a totally new environment and culture. Um, the Washington metropolitan area, during the time I was coming along, um, and for many, many years after I actually grew up, was so starkly different than the, the, than the environment in Florida. It's a, it was a night and day scenario. I often tell people that my friends knew of the way of life that they shared here in the Washington metropolitan area where they primarily could go even through the 50s into the 60s, they could go anywhere they wanted to uh, for the most part. And I spent a lot of time, of course, visiting and spending time with my aunt in Ocala. And it was a stark difference here. There were so many places we couldn't go. Uh, I used to wonder why we would drive the 17 hours from DC to Ocala nonstop, never stopping in restaurants. Well, there was a reason. It's because there was no place to stay and there were no restaurants to eat. So there was my mother's ability to adapt to a, a totally new environment, which was always amazing to me, how she, how she could figure out things that were foreign to her, but yet adapt, but she did. Um, and so, the other things that would come along in time in my evolution, in terms of my understanding of my mom, was, you know, I never knew, never knew why Christmas was such a struggle for her. Um, but she would always make it her goal to make sure that Christmas was a special time for me. And um, and so that phase of my mother's dedication to doing one thing, which was raising me, that ended when, not really ended, but she started to make her second phase of life um, become apparent and uh, focused when I was graduating from college uh, and she had met one of the major goals that she had, which was to get me educated, and get me off into, uh, into the work world. And at that time, uh, and actually a few years later, 
she would then have the second big phase of her life, which was to help me as a shared custody parent raise my son, who clearly became the apple of her eye. So, um, <clears throat> um, so right around that time also was the time that Ben wrote the book. And um, one of the things I, I know people find amazing is my mother and my aunt made a dedication to each other that they were not going to show their emotion at the funeral of my grandfather. Well, that served them, that didn't really serve them well because it actually put my mother in a, a situation where she so repressed and suppressed her feelings that she never properly grieved. And during that non-grieving process, she was never able to fully tell me the legacy of my grandparents. And it wasn't until Ben Green's book was written that I got the full story. And I remember not as a person that's an avid reader, but reading that book cover to cover and, and discovering the wonderful work that my grandfather and grandmother had done. And, and then it started to answer a lot of the questions about my mother, her approach to life, what she had been through, the amazing strength that she had. And also it revealed a lot more about my aunt. But right around that time, she started to take on a different phase, which was that last phase of her life where it was so critical for her to make sure that the story was told. And so she started um, countless visits to Florida and many trips, uh, doing uh, tag team sessions with Ben, and they would do uh, a lot of speaking engagements. And I know she actually uh, visited some school out in Kansas one time. And so at her tender age, she was on the go. And that was her mission. This story must be told. Um, at home, she started trying to write her own document of, of his life story. And so, um, it was, it was an amazing journey for her, um, um, the book, and then right after that, the documentary that was created. Uh, we actually were present when uh, Ozzie Davis and Ruby Dee recorded up in White Plains, uh, New York, the, um, the actual soundtrack to the documentary. Uh, I know that plays here in the Washington area two to three times in February every year. And then of course the work and all of the trips back to Florida to be a part of the, the home site center. That was another great step in this evolution of her being able to get the story told. And so that was what she did until her last days. And, um, and so now the legacy has been left to me and Darren. I would say that Darren is probably much more of an elegant speaker than I am, a lot younger also. And so um, it is what we have a mission to do now, to make sure that her wishes are well um, realized and, and for us to continue the story and, and, and the legacy of, of, of a person that really was so instrumental in, in our history but very few people know about. So with that, um, I, I just wanted to, again, thank, um, thank everyone for inviting me. And I would uh, love to be able to share uh, in the question and answer period, any other questions that might come up about who she was and, and, um, and her life as I knew it, as well as my aunt. Wow. Thank you all so much. That was really incredible. You know, I was thinking tomorrow when I go to work and I see Dawn's piece, pieces, Peaches and Evangeline, which I see every day, I think I'll no doubt see it as an incredible artwork, but also as a monument, you know, to Evangeline and Harry T. Moore and their legacy will live on thanks to all the work that you're doing. 
So uh, I'm going to ask, uh, ask some questions from the attendees, starting with our uh, director and CEO, Elizabeth Dunbar, who asks, Skip and or Ben, do you know the circumstances around the photograph that Dawn depicted? That, uh, I know that we had, um, I retained several pictures, uh, family pictures, and I think that was one of the family pictures that my mother had. Uh, she had uh, any number of pictures. Uh, she was really big on, on, on preserving um, time in, in pictures. And so that was one of the many pictures that she had. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you have anything more to add, uh, Ben. Yeah, I think that was, I, I need to go back and actually look. I think it was probably they were in high school or maybe their mm. first college years. One interesting thing, um, all four of the Moors, Harry, Harriet, Evangeline, and Peaches graduated from Bethune-Cookman College, yeah. which was 25 miles away from Mims in uh, Daytona Beach. So they were big Bethune grads. That may have been when they were uh, going to college. But yeah, it, it, you know, Evangeline had lots of family pictures. Yeah. So one, I just want to say that you are all also open to ask questions to each other. Don't be shy, but I, I'm just wondering, getting all of you in the room together, how does this influence your work? I mean, Skip, I enjoyed hearing about how Ben's book influenced your own view of your family's history. Um, what's it like seeing your mother's uh, through Dawn's artwork? And Dawn, oh, what it's, is it? Yeah. It, it's it. just, uh, you know, I was, I was so pleased. I can't say how much it was. It was a, a shock, but a, a pleasant shock to see that, you know, the, that wonderful piece of work. So thank you, thank you. It's my pleasure, it's my pleasure. Ben, isn't the photograph a part of your book? Yeah, it's in the book, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, I thought so. Yeah, I, I just wanna say hearing Dawn tell the story about finding my book without a cover in some <laughs> used bookstore, <laughs> I just love that. And then it, be, it becomes the inspiration for art. Yeah. I mean, I think, right. That's one of the things in telling the story. The arts have really helped. I mean, there's my book. There was a documentary that Skip mentioned. It's called Freedom Never Dies, which is wonderful. It was shown on PBS. We now, there's now a painting. Uh, there's a wonderful song. Google this. Uh, Sweet Honey in the Rock singing right. the ballad of Harry Moore. Oh, um, wow. And what happened that the lyrics were written by Langston Hughes. There was a big um, memorial service for them after their death at, at Madison Square Garden and the NAACP hired Langston Hughes to write the lyrics. And then it was lost in the ether of history. And I found the lyrics at the Smithsonian and then the filmmakers hired Sweet Honey to do their version. We don't know what the original music sounded like, but couldn't have been any better than Sweet Honey. So yep. the arts can really help um, keep this story out there and interpret the story. So, but it was wonderful to me to hear, especially like just the little thing that didn't have a cover. <laughs> you didn't even know what it kind of what it was. <laughs> it was great. You know, I think that's interesting, Ben, because um, you know, I'd always known the Sweet Honey and the Rock. Um, they're very instrumental. They 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 do a lot of cultural, wonderful work in the Washington metropolitan area. And uh, they, they are a, a vocal activist group, maybe. You could call them, maybe refer to them as, as that. And, um, and so we had actually the pleasure of having them come down to, I think it was down in um, uh, Melbourne. And they performed at a, a junior college there live. And we were honored enough to be there at that time and sat there on the front row and they performed that as well as some of their other works. And uh, we got a chance to meet them backstage. And it was interesting, only a few weeks later, I would see them again at a restaurant on a Sunday morning brunch and they remembered me. But uh, you know that that's also a, a really monumental thing. I, I tell people all the time uh, of the, the work in Langston Hughes works. Uh, and I, I often ask people, you know, to go and, and, and actually read the poem and then uh, listen to the soundtrack. Of course, I've got a copy of it. 
by the way, if you Google it on YouTube, if you go on YouTube, you're going to find not just Sweet Honey doing that song has been performed now all oh, really? over the place. Oh, it just goes on and on. There are church groups performing it with dancers. Uh, I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, there are get solo guitarists playing it and singing it. It's it's really kind of had a life of its own as well. Ben, wow. say the name again. The Ballad Even of Harry facts. Moore. Yeah. Oh, it's the Ballad of Harry T. Moore. Right. Yeah. And the documentary is called Freedom Never Dies. And uh, it's, I mean, it came out on VHS. It then was on DVD, but you can probably find it pirated on YouTube as well, mm -hmm. I'm sure. <laughs> but it's really- Adam, well did, the, did the libraries have any problems obtaining copies of the book? Uh, not of Ben's book, uh, some of the other books, they, they did, but um, most of them they were able to get. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. And Dawn, how, how about you? How does hearing uh, from, from Skip and Ben alter how you see your own artwork? I have to tell you that um, it's most gratifying to listen to both of you speak today. I have enjoyed it immensely. Uh, it's the, as, as I have said uh, many times, it's history is something that I think we take for granted. And the old adage is that if you don't know your history, you are bound to repeat it. And that's true. And the, uh, the fact that the story of the Moors had, when I discovered it, had not been told. Um, it's, it's just frightening that something so instrumental in the history of this nation, um, in the history of our people has hap or happened that these two people, that they should go unsung, unheard of, unknown, it's, it would have just been a tragedy. So uh, thank you for providing the history and, and, and in a form um, initially in the book and then in the documentary and now in this piece of artwork that um, that's why I do what I do uh, in this particular form so that because a lot of folk may never have come across the book. I came across it purely by accident. Mm -hmm. A lot of people um, might not know the song. They might not have seen the documentary, but at least some of the folks in, uh, in uh, Georgia and in Florida and, in, and now uh, with this Zoom call all over the country have seen the piece. They know about the Moors. And so it's no longer this secret that um, the powers that be would have not wanted us to know about. So that's exactly why I do what I do to tell those little known stories. Don, by the way, I had never heard of them either until I started working on this book. I'm from Florida. I used to be a social studies teacher. I was an activist. I thought, why have I never heard of them? So how did you come state? across it? Well, the case had been reopened one of the time back oh. when I started. On, but get this, I thought maybe it's because I'm a white guy. I bet you in the African-American community, oh. this is in Florida, this is well known. I realized not at all. And yeah. what brought that home, I did a presentation at the Black Archives at FAMU here in Tallahassee. And at the end of it, an, one of the archivists came up to me and said, an elderly black woman, elderly, probably my age now, came up to me and said, I taught social studies for 40 years in Ocala where Peaches lived. I never heard of Harry T. Moore until your book came out. And I realized it ain't just the bald headed white guy, you know, that this story just, unless your family was directly involved in the NAACP in Florida at that time, this story vanished. And I think a lot of that was because it was in Florida. I, I've been saying, if this had happened in Mississippi or Alabama, I don't think they would have been forgotten because we expect that. 
it's kind of right. part of the yeah, heritage of Mississippi and Alabama. Here that's in Florida, true. Florida was supposed to be different. And this story disappeared from the from coverage in Florida quicker than anywhere else. They wanted this story to go away mm -hmm. and let's get back to come on down on your vacation. There was even at one point, a, there was a group organizing a boycott of Florida citrus over the bombing. And there's a, you know, a note to the governor and it's like, we got to do something about this. We got to make this disappear because it's hurting tourism. It's mm -hmm. hurting business. So I think because it happened in Florida, it vanished even faster. And the interesting thing is that um, even to this day, and as you say, it's getting to be too late for the in investigation into the, the um, culprit to take place. Uh, but as you say, they, they made the story go away and you know we can only surmise who they are, uh, but um, it, so we have succeeded in uh, in foiling their plans because now everybody knows about Harry T. Moore. Um, well, sadly, do, do you know? Not everybody. <laughs> well. Lots more people know about it today yeah, than yeah, knew yeah. about it yesterday. Anyway. That, honestly, that's why I'm so excited about this curriculum that they're developing in Brevard yeah. County. They're going to teach this to every middle schooler in Brevard County. And they're hoping that once they get the curriculum off the ground, it will spread to other school districts, even though, frankly, the state of Florida just passed the bill and, you know, they're the anti-woke bill that the governor signed you know, that if you make any person uncomfortable about racial history, you know, you can sue the school board. So I even had a reporter ask me, do you think they'll even be able to teach it in Brevard County? And that's a good question. So far, so good. But yeah. that's why I want to institutionalize this story in yeah. the textbooks so it can't just be a one off. You know, we give yeah. a talk and then it goes away. Yeah, you know, I, I want to add something. Um, So years ago, this was in about 2008, um, one of the franchise owners of uh, the business I was in at that point in time, he lived in, he lives in Melbourne, his franchise, his, his uh, recruiting staffing franchise was in that area. His daughter, I think she was in the eighth grade. She came home and in their conversation about schooling, she referenced uh, my grandparents, and and there was some discussion in her class about them, and um, somehow he made the correlation and called me and said, I think you told me about this. Are they your grandparents? And I said, absolutely. So I don't know whatever happened to that initiative, but that was back in 2008. So I don't know if they eventually decided not to continue to teach that, but I think it was being taught at the eighth, eighth grade level. I think I and know this... why. There was a, the, the, the chairman of the school board right now who started this initiative, when all this really got going, he called me up and he said, I know you don't remember me, but 20 years ago, I was a student at FSU, at Florida State, and you came and talked about Harry T. Moore at my class. And I got so enthusiastic, I wrote my senior thesis on him. And then I went back home to Brevard County and started teaching social studies. And I think it may have been that. that and now really he says, was. now here I am on the school board saying, let's do this as a curriculum. So you never know what yeah. one little contact will ripple down the road and do, you know. There's a nice comment in here from one of our uh, docents who said, I gave two tours yesterday to Dawn's exhibition to elementary students. And we spent a lot of time with this piece and with the other pieces in the gallery. We had great discussions and the teacher was able to introduce the civil rights movement to the students noting that it'll be coming up soon in their curriculum. Mm -hmm. Thank you for these great pieces and opportunities to share with the students. That's what it's all about, uh, the next generation. You have to know where you came from in order to figure out how you got here and where you're gonna go from here. So. 
and it's not just Florida that has issues with uh, uh, things that are taught in school or um, how close your voting place is to where you live. So let's not pick on Florida because there's a bunch of other places that are having the same problem. Isn't it interesting that uh, here we are, what, 50, 60 years later, and we're sort of rehashing history or reliving things that we, I thought we had gotten past. And here we are having to talk about, you know, books being burned and curriculums being banned and voting being an issue and women's rights being an issue. You know, we, I'm not getting it, but I'm gonna keep making artwork all about it. So stay tuned. No, I think we all have to do a part. You know, I, uh, I've often spoken to the people of my generation and, you know, I, I, I have to call their attention to the fact that, you know, your, your life, if you never traveled to the deep south, you, you don't know the tremendous sacrifices that were made yeah. uh, by people like my grandparents. And, and, and I say, so you, 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 have to, you have to understand that all of these freedoms, and again, it was a night and day scenario for me, being at home, versus being on, in Ocala. It was a night and day scenario. And, and, and so I, I try to call their attention to the fact that you've got these liberties, you've got these freedoms, you are able to do so many things, but it, it wasn't always that way. And somebody paid for you to be able to do those things and, and have these liberties. And so, you know, a uh, younger person that I was, you know, I didn't have that many of those discussions, some of them, but as a, a more mature gray haired person, I can really have those discussions uh, and, and, and share, you know, the feelings that, you know, we, we, a tremendous price has been paid for what we have. And if we, if we just let it go as it is, the clock, they'll just roll everything back. So we have to move. What you're doing is, is wonderful because it, it keeps us moving in the right direction and doesn't allow us to move backwards. Very good. Were there more questions, Adam? We don't um, want to leave I, anybody out while we have time. here. Sure. So this one is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, Skip, at what age did your son learn about how his great grandparents lived and died? How is their legacy taught to young people in your family? Well, um, I kind of remember that day. It was uh, challenging. So uh, when the uh, documentary came out, we, we got a copy, a pre-copy. Um, and um, I got to believe he was about six-ish. And, um, you know, as a shared custody parent, my mom would come up on the weekends and the time that Darren was with me. And so one Saturday, you know, we had had our dinner. She would come up and cook dinner for us. And we sat down and she started the video. And um, I guess about five, 10 minutes into this, it got to be a little overwhelming for him. And, you know, when, when you talk about history repeating itself, um, he got very upset and he made the same statement that my mother made. And just like my mother got corrected by her mother, she corrected him. She said, he said, I hate white people. And he got corrected just like my mother did on my grandmother's deathbed when she told my mother, you're, you're a beautiful child. Hate makes people ugly and you're not gonna be ugly. She didn't use the same words, but it was the same message. So I think that was the first time he learned of, of some piece of the story. And then as he has continued to grow, he's learned more and more of it. And, and but that was, I, I remember that uh, just like it was yesterday. It was, it was in our home, in my home. You know, your mother uh, told me when I first met her and first started working on the book that uh, a lot of her friends 
in DC didn't know about it. Right. And when you think about it, she was, you know, she had just come home for Christmas and finds the house is blown up and her one, her father's dead and her mother's dying. And she goes back to DC. How do you tell that to people? How do you tell that story? How do you say, my parents are civil rights martyrs and you've never heard of them? You know, people say, right. yeah, right. Exactly. You know, and I'm the man exactly. on the moon. Like, what? you know, I mean, if it, if you were, if they were known, then she could have told it. But she, one is, as Skip said, she had to repress this. She just had to get away from it. And right. she and Skip, she and Peaches, not only did they make a pledge not to break down, she told me they never really talked about it. The two of them yeah. until, you know, uh, their rest of their lives, because it was so, to bury both your parents right. in a week was so overwhelming they just couldn't deal with it. They just had to kind of put it aside. And so she got out of Florida. Uh, most of her friends in DC knew her by her first name, Juanita. Mm -hmm. She kind of changed her identity almost, you know, and I think it was only as this began to unfold that it was safe enough for her to talk about it herself and then to begin to talk about it to her friends. And then finally go through the process of starting to grieve. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I know my, my aunt, she was, because she was in the home and it was dark at 10, 20, whatever it was, she was never able to sleep at night without a nightlight. She was wow. terrified of darkness. Wow. And, and so to her dying day, she, she would always have a nightlight or some kind of lamp on when she went to bed at night. Mm. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah, your mother told me at one point, she said, I was a very angry person. And she really didn't know where that anger came from until she started getting in touch with all this and realized it was, she'd never grieved. She'd never gone through the stages of, you know, denial Losing and anger somebody. and, yeah, and right. all that. And it came out in other ways, you know, but until she really started working through this and getting in touch with it, it she wasn't even aware of how it affected her in her own life. Yet, among all of the anger, you couldn't have found a more giving person. Really. Well, thank you all so much, Don Williams Boyd. Ben Green, Draper Skip Pagan for this really compelling evening. Uh, I, I think also hearing the three of you talk to each other was, was a real highlight and, and really special. Uh, it was amazing to hear about Harry T. Moore and Evangeline through the lens of contemporary art, uh, history through lived experience. It was really powerful. Thank you again for uh, being with us. Um, it's my pleasure. Yes. Again, Dawn's exhibition, Woe, uh, will be at the Everson until April 10th. So please come and take a look. Uh, to learn more about the exhibition and other Everson programs, please visit everson.org. Or you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a great way to keep in touch at everson.org slash subscribe. Thanks again to the Colby Foundation, the Lenore G. Tony Foundation, Syracuse University Libraries, and the Onondaga County Libraries for sponsoring this evening's program. And thank you, uh, everyone, for coming and have a fantastic evening. All right. Thanks so much. Very good. Thank you very much, Adam. You did a great job. Yes. Thanks, y'all. It's nice to meet you. All righty. Good meeting you. Good night. So, Adam, I'm not going to make it to Syracuse, obviously, before the 10th. Is there, are there um, online images of the, the other pieces in Dawn's work? Or? Yeah, there's online images. Also, um, a lot of them are on Dawn's website, actually. Uh, you can go to her, her website and check them out. Um, I'd also be more than happy to give you a virtual tour anytime and we'll walk you through the exhibition. Wow. Yeah, my pleasure. Advertising. My website is my name, dawnwilliamsboyd.com. Put it in the chat. And now this is in this is in New York, not in Atlanta. The exhibit is at, at the Everson in New York, yes. In, New York, in Syracuse. Yes. In Syracuse. Mm -hmm. 
So Don, meeting you is the best thing about this evening. This has been- Well, thank great. you. Really thank you. Likewise, both of you. Yes, yes. All right, thank you very much, y'all. All right, I'm gonna yeah. get back to work. Have a good evening. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming. All right. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Adam. See you, Skip. Thanks, Adam. Talk All soon. Right. Bye. Bye.